Voucher, hello and welcome to Keith's Whiskey Vlog. My name is Keith and as well as here on YouTube you can also find me on Instagram at Whiskey Tour Guide Keith, all one word. Now most of my videos are about whiskey but I don't want to disappoint anyone too much. This is not going to concentrate on whiskey, instead we are going to introduce you to Scotland. In my job as a tour guide I get to travel all around Scotland, north, east, west, south, all directions, different times of year, different weather conditions, I get to see it in all its guises and as I go around I get to know the land, I get to learn about its history and also get to absorb the culture in Scotland. So in this video I'm going to talk to you about the land, the history and the culture of Scotland. If you like your whisky this should help you to get a, a wider deeper appreciation for Scotland and obviously therefore our national drink which is whisky. So I'm going to talk to you about the land first of all. Now being a tour guide I need a map and I've also got a nice handy little pointer, the whisky tour guide Keith pointer. If you can indulge me around this way I'm sure you know this is Scotland, the mainland and all the islands as well. So I'll tell you first of all about the land in Scotland. Now essentially there are two completely different landscapes. You have the highlands and lowlands. The highlands and lowlands. The north and the west of the country are the highlands. The south and the east are the lowlands and they're divided by what's called the Highland Boundary Fault Line. It's a physical, sort of geological fault line and it runs, depends what way, northeast, southwest, right through the middle of the country. From here, just south of Aberdeen, a little town called Stonehaven, love a little harbour town and the Highland Line runs southwest all the way down through Loch Lomond, you may have heard of Loch Lomond, the famous song, and it exits the west coast of the mainland around about Helensburgh, a town just down here, and it continues right down through the Isle of Arran. So the highlands of Scotland, the north and the west, the lowlands, the south and the east. Now the highlands, we tend to call it the highlands and islands. So you've got all these islands here, uh, you've got the Orkney Islands, the Shetland Islands, a lot more sort of Viking heritage up here, lower lying islands, a bit more sort of fertile. Over here off the west coast you have the Hebrides. Now you've got two sets of Hebrides, you've got the outer Hebrides, almost like a shield facing the Atlantic Ocean off to the west. And in the outer Hebrides you have the big island up here, Lewis and Harris. You come down through North Uist, Benbecula, South Uist, down towards the Isle of Barra, Eriski as well. And there are countless other islands, some populated, some not, in the Outer Hebrides. The islands between the Outer Hebrides and the mainland are the Inner Hebrides. Now probably the most well-known island in Scotland is this island here. This is the Isle of Skye. Most people who visit a Scottish island make for Skye and probably because it's the most easily accessible. Although it's an island, right here it is connected to the mainland by a bridge. Guess what it's called? Skye Bridge. So you can land in Edinburgh, you can land in Glasgow, hire a car, meander your way up through these crazy little roads, the old sort of cattle droving routes and make your way to Skye and drive straight on to the island. So Skye is one of the inner Hebrides. As you come down you've got islands like Mull, uh, the island of Iona where a lot of the Scottish kings used to be buried. You come further down the Isle of Jura and Isla over here and as you come down you've got the Isle of Arran. So these are the inner Hebrides. So in the highlands the landscape is characterised, it's much more rocky, rugged terrain, more mountainous. We have 282 mountains in Scotland. Now we classify a mountain as anything that is higher than 3,000 feet above sea level. So 282 mountains by that definition, every single one of them in the highlands. 
down in the lowlands, the south and the east, you've essentially got two landscapes in the lowlands. You've got the central lowlands, this area here, and most of Scotland's population lives in the central lowlands. And then this area known as the borders is also it's known as the southern uplands. And this is much more hilly. No mountains, some that look like mountains, but um, some lovely landscape. But the lowlands in general is much more sort of fertile, a lot of arable farmland, much sort of greener and more lush than the, sort of the wild, rugged highlands. In Scotland, most of the population lives in the lowlands. The population of Scotland is about five and a half million. And about half a million or so live in the highlands and islands, around about five million down here in the lowlands. The main cities in the, in the lowlands, or in Scotland in general, you've got the capital, Edinburgh. Uh, this is where I'm based for my job as a tour guide. So as I say, heading from there all over. Uh, over in the west, you have the biggest city, the largest by population, Glasgow. Between the two, the centre of Scotland is Stirling. As you come up, you've got the city of Perth at the mouth of the River Tay, Dundee, further along the Tay estuary. And as you come up the coast, you've got Aberdeen. So those are the main cities and the main population in Scotland. So that's a little bit about the land in Scotland. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. I'm going to talk to you now about the history of Scotland. Rich, varied and very interesting. Something for everybody in Scottish history. In Scottish history it goes back almost as far as any sort of certainly North European civilization that we know of. There's loads of history in Scotland that predates, for instance, the, the pyramid building in Egypt. The pyramids were built around about, uh, about four and a half thousand years ago. If you go back a thousand years before that, again we'll go back to our map, are we up in the north? This archipelago up here, the Orkney Islands. Um, the mainland, the big island in Orkney, is a world heritage site and there's all sorts of fascinating sites. Uh, it's well worth a visit, I'd, I'd highly recommend you visit Orkney. So over on the west coast there, there's a little village, it's called Skara Bray. And Skara Bray, it's almost like a little hobbit village. It was buried for centuries under sand, under sand dunes. And there was a big storm in the mid 1800s. The sand was washed away and this little village was exposed. So Skara Bray, you're talking about five and a half thousand years old, four and a half thousand BC, something like that. You've also got sites on Orkney. You've got the Maze Howe burial chamber fascinating little burial chamber, a little low tunnel, you can go in and see the, the, the sort of central room. Um, what else is on Orkney? You've got standing stones, you've got the stones at Stennis, not as well known as the Ring of Brodgar, a little bit further along, but um, both in their own right, well worth a visit. So Orkney, the Orkney Islands up here. History, we don't know what language they spoke, uh, we don't know much about these people just so far back in the mists of time. So that's about five and a half thousand years ago. You can go back even 100, 200 years before that. The oldest known archeological site is a bit further north, a little island called Papa Westray. And there's a place called the Knapp of Hower, which goes back maybe 5,700 years ago. So incredible history up there. Now, over on Lewis, over here in the, the west of Lewis, Another site with standing stones dating back about 5,000 years is the Kalanish standing stones. And again, very well worth a visit. I mean, everywhere in Scotland's worth a visit, really. But anyway, uh, we're talking about 5,000 years or so ago for the stones at Kalanish. And remember, both of these sites predating the Egyptians, the pyramids, the great pyramids at Giza. Now, we're going to jump forward just a small number of about 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, um, we had our first sort of tourists arriving in Scotland, some people from what is now Italy, known as the Romans. Now in the first century BC, the Romans first landed away down in the south, they came up through England and they came up into Scotland and they properly settled in the first century AD. Now at the time uh, the Romans pushed north, they were looking for minerals, maybe things like slaves, make some money. 
but they met a bit of resistance in the very north and they started to build walls. The most famous wall was in the north of what is today England, Hadrian's Wall, pretty much east to west down here. But the Romans did come into Scotland, uh, they built forts, they built roads, there's all sorts of Roman archaeology in Scotland as well. And they hung about for maybe about 400 or so years. Now, when the Romans left, there's no real cut-off date. They slowly withdrew. And for the next 400 or so years, we don't really know much about history. Not just in Scotland, but across Britain, Wales, England. Uh, it's known as the Dark Ages. There's just not much in the way of historical records. We come up to the late seven, 700s. And after the Roman tourist invasion, we start to get a Scandinavian tourist invasion. And the people from across here, uh, the Vikings, the Norsemen, the men from the north. So they come across. There's loads of Viking heritage up in the Orkney and Shetland Islands. A famous festival in the Shetland Islands every year called Uphelia. Uh, they burn boats and march through the streets with burning torches. Check that out. So loads and loads of Viking heritage on these islands, but also all the way around the coast there's places, even down as far as Isla, there's places with um, the old Norse language um, place names on Isla, and all the way around Skye, Lewis and Harris and other islands as well. Now the Vikings got a bit of a bad name, they, they pillaged and they plundered, they certainly helped themselves, they raised abbeys to the ground, killed the monks etc. But they did also trade, they settled, and it's thought to be the the threat of the, the Vikings that got the two main tribes in Scotland. I'm over generalising, but in the west you've got the Celtic people, and in the east you have the Picts. And these people merged their kingdom, and in 843 we have the establishment of the Kingdom of the Scots, thought to be to try and get together to push out the Vikings, the, the Norse Kingdom, if you like. Okay, so for the next few hundred years in Scotland, you've got uh, the formation, if you like, of the Scotland that we have today. The Lothians and Strathclyde joined up in the 1100s with the Kingdom of the Scots. You've got Galloway, this area here, pointer. Uh, you've also got the, the islands into the sort of 1200s becoming part of the Kingdom of the Scots and then Orkney and Shetland which had been part of the Norse Kingdom and by the late 1400s the border that we see today here pretty much became established and these lands and islands became part of the Kingdom of the Scots. In the late 1400s incidentally we also have the um, the first references in Scottish history to distilling whisky. So a very important time. Now after the 1400s, into the 1500s we have the Reformation and this is when the Catholics and the Protestants, to cut a very long story short, they didn't get on. People were burned at the stake, people were executed. Uh, the Kirk, the Scottish Church, the Protestant Church was formed. Into the 1600s, a big important event, this is when the Scottish King, known as James VI of Scotland, found himself to be the heir to the English throne. The English Queen Elizabeth I died in 1603 without leaving any heirs. So English historians will tell you this is called the Union of the Crowns, when the Scottish King also became the King of England. Scottish historians will tell you this is when Scotland took over England and that's how it's been pretty much ever since. That was in 1603. Um, about 100 years later you've got uh, the Treaty of Union which is the political amalgamation of Scotland and England. The Scottish Parliament voted itself out of existence and Scottish members of Parliament went down to London to the new Parliament of Great Britain. And that's pretty much where we are today. It's been peace and harmony ever since. Uh, I would tell you a bit more about the more recent political events in, in Scotland and the UK, but I've not had enough whiskies at this point, so we'll save that for another time. So there's a that sort of brief run through of Scottish history. So the land, beautiful landscape, very dramatic, uh, very evocative, and you've got this history littered all the way through it as well from 
people who we don't know much about, away back, Kalanish, away up in Orkney, right through the Romans, through the formation of the Kingdom of the Scots, um, the Union of the Crowns, the Political Union, the Treaty of Union, right up to the present day. So fascinating history. Hopefully that gives you a little taste of it as well. Oof. So, a lot to take in there. Talk to you about the land, talk to you about history. We'll now talk to you a little bit more about Scottish culture. The culture in Scotland is sort of dominated, I suppose, by the language. Now, I'm speaking English, but it's a sort of Scottish form of English. The main language spoken in Scotland is English. But it's a bit of an amalgam of, obviously, English, but with a little bit of Scots. Scots is a form of English that predates English. It's quite closely related to English. Scots is actually more closely related to Old English than modern English is to Old English. So the English that we speak and the Old Scots are quite interchangeable. So a lot of the Old Scots words have made their way into the English that we speak in Scotland. And there's another language in Scotland also, it's still spoken today, um, primarily in the Northwest Highlands and Islands. It used to be spoken all across Scotland, and that is Gaelic. Now it's quite similar to the Gaelic that you get in Ireland. So in Ireland you have Gaelic, in Scotland you have Gaelic. And they are very closely related. They are classed as separate languages, but they are quite closely related. And Gaelic is not related to English. So the English that we speak has the old Scots coming into it, and it also has some words that come in from Gaelic. A lot of place names in Scotland are from Gaelic, and just by looking at the map you can see where Gaelic was spoken. If the place name doesn't make much sense in English, and especially if it's got the <laughs> sounds in it, then it's almost certainly come from Gaelic. Some Scottish place names also come from another sort of the pre-English and pre-Scots languages that were spoken and we're going way back into the first millennia AD and we're talking about Britonic or Brythonic languages, a bit more closely related to modern Welsh, so the Welsh language. Okay, so there's a lot of accents in Scotland. People talk about the Scottish accent. Now I have a Scottish accent. But if you go into the borders, down into the south of Scotland, almost every single town you go to has a different accent. The Edinburgh accent and the Glasgow accent, you can tell immediately. There's around about 40 miles between them. And you can tell straight away if somebody's from the west or from the east of, well, say the east, east of the central belt. If you go up to Dundee, they've got a very thick accent. You go into the, the highlands and islands, um, different accents. And if you come up the northeast, there's a sort of the old Doric language, another old Scottish language, uh, almost unintelligible to people who don't come from the northeast. And if you go all the way up to the Orkney Islands and further, again, different accents. So we do have lots and lots of Scottish accents in the English that we speak. So some of the Gaelic words that we use, if you like, or that have morphed into the English that we speak. The first word that I used here, it's, it's still quite a true Gaelic word. The first word I used in this vlog was Falcha, which is welcome. You'll see it if you arrive in Scotland at airports, maybe in train stations, welcome to Scotland. And it'll say Falcha Gu Alaba, welcome to Scotland. Alaba, A-L-B-A, is the Gaelic name, Gaelic word for Scotland. So Falcha, welcome. Um, in the Highlands, as well as the place names and the mountains, you've got lots of lochs and glens. A loch is just simply a lake, so again, looking at our little map, um, we've got Loch Ness, world famous, this big long sliver of water here, just about 22 miles long. Loch Ness, L-O-C-H, Loch comes from Gaelic, it means lake. Loch Lomond, I mentioned as well. So you're not really saying loch properly unless you're spitting on the people around you, so don't be too shy. Glens, a glen is just a valley. Uh, glen Co, very famous as well. Where's Glen Co? This is Glen Co here. Beautiful landscape, high mountains, narrow valley, very picturesque. And you've also got a little bit of history, the massacre of Glen Co in 1692. So a glen is a valley, a loch is a lake. And these come from Gaelic 
into English. Another very popular word, very, very popular word with me that we use in English comes from Gaelic, and that is the word for whiskey. Obviously, whiskey used all around the world, Ireland, America, Canada, Japan, everywhere really. And whiskey comes from Gaelic. The Gaelic name for whiskey is Ushkaba. Ushkaba. And that translates simply as the water of life. Ushkaba, water of life. So the word whiskey in English comes from Ushka. Ushka, whiskey. Ushka, whiskey. That's where it comes from. So you've got this Gaelic influence. At the end of this, I'll give you a little farewell, I'll give you a little toast, and I shall be saying Slan Java. And this is Gaelic for good health. Cheers. It's a nice little Gaelic toast that we do. Very appropriate when you are drinking whiskey. Uh, now, the Gaelic language in Scotland, as I say, the population is maybe five and a half million or so. I think there's just under 60,000 people speak Gaelic in Scotland as a first language. The amount of Gaelic speakers has been in decline for years. Uh, it was really persecuted for a long time, but the last maybe four or five decades, its importance, its cultural significance has been recognised and it's levelled out and I believe starting to rise again. It's become a little bit trendy to speak some Gaelic. Uh, there's a Gaelic college now up on the Isle of Skye and if you go to Glasgow or Edinburgh, the larger cities, there's some Gaelic primary schools, just all lessons in Gaelic and it's starting to be taught at secondary school level as well. Um, so you'll see quite a lot of the old Scots influence in the English we speak. You'll see a lot of Gaelic influence in Scotland as well. There's some Scots words. I'll give you one or two Scots words before we go. And um, you may have heard them, you may not. Uh, the word I, it's not the things in your head. I means yes. Would you like to go for a drink, Keith? I. There you go common usage. Uh, another thing, once you go for a drink, you might have a blether. A blether is just a chat. It can be a type of person who's a chatterbox, but if you're going to have a blether, you're having a having a chat, having a conversation. Uh, if you go for somebody, go, go for a chat with somebody, go for a blether, uh, you might have a bra blether. Bra, B-R-A-W, means good, very good. If it's a nice sunny day outside, the weather is bra. There you go. Uh, what else have we got? <laughs> Good Scottish word is uh, bahuki. Now bahuki, I am sitting on my bahuki. So there you go. Good bahuki. Um, what else have we got? I think what I'm starting to do actually, I'm starting to haver. If you like the proclaimers, when I haver. So haver is when you tend to talk a little bit too much. You start to go on a little bit and quite simply you're talking a bit of nonsense. So I'm starting to haver. So it's a few Scottish words for you. We'll leave it there. Right, before I go, I like to end my videos quite simply. I've got uh, some whiskey up here. I'm gonna go for the Glen Keith today. Finish off with a little whiskey. This is a whiskey from Speyside, the northeast of Scotland. And uh, obviously, it was very nice of them to name a whole distillery after me. So, I'll repay the favor. Have a little bit of Glen Keith for you. Quite a big glass, so I'll not pour too big a, a dram. Okie dokie. Uh, if you liked this video, hopefully it's taught you a little bit about the land, the culture, the history. A nice introduction to Scotland. If you liked the video, like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow me on Instagram, at Whiskey Tour Guide Keith. All I can really say now though is, cheers, Slan Java.